Welcome to Illumination Week. It wasn't intended to be this way, but I always knew for one of our final terrible slots for 2020, I was of course gonna cover the studio with like the worst track record amongst the people. And this was originally intended to be covering the terrible Sing movie, and sure, it's still a bad movie, don't get me wrong, but the reviews are awfully fresh. It felt a little jarring to just rail on it like that. Plus, also, it's getting a sequel, so it's way easier to just bung it into the Coming Back series instead. And worryingly, looking at all of Illumination's lineup, they're pretty positively liked for its generic symbolism. All of them, except for one. Hop. Oh yeah. And with Sonic being the clear, ironic winner of filmmaking this year thanks to circumstances, why not compare its older, more contorted brother as an end of year bash? And hey look, it's not all doom and gloom, I love these Universal logo remixes. Less of a fan of this logo though. Can you believe this came out a year after Despicable Me 1? I mean, this feels ancient. I can't explain why though. Oh, also, this is actually an Easter film that I'm covering in December, so we'll just pretend it's a Christmas film, all right? So much like the lore of Arthur Christmas, a personal fave of mine, the role of the Easter Bunny is handled by each passing generation. You have to be majestic, dignified, and a bunny. Wow, how smart. But Fred O'Hare here is our first ever human Easter Bunny. How interesting of a concept, except this is literally the end of the film. Like... But sure, I guess it's a storybook tale without the storybook. Hmm. And hey, prepare for all the Sonic movie references, because it's James Marsden again. He's really got a thing for hanging out with CGI furry characters, doesn't he? Guess he was way ahead of his time. His own time. Anyway, there he is, the golden boy and his questionable CGI. The bunny playing bongos. And he is offered by his dad to see him at work. Introducing Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, well, I, I guess Easter Chocolate Factory? Uh, Christmas Chocolate Factory? Uh, Alright, just imagine them making Santas or something, okay? <laughs> Here are all your strange imaginary devices. There's chicks on rollerblades, saw blade shapings, gummy bunnies, totally not cream eggs, everything you can think of. Is this the established law for the Easter Bunny? I never pictured all this as a kid. This is definitely more Santa's magic. Plus, it sounds a lot harder to market with all that fur handling your food. Blech. Anyway, our protagonist rabbit's name is... not really a name, I guess. It's just E.B. Just an initial. I mean, sure, I guess we accept, like, PJ as a name in reality, but EB? You'll never guess what it stands for. A terrible name for a terrible movie. Oh, and the dad is voiced by Hugh Laurie. Huh. His name, by the way, is Mr. Bunny. Or just Dad. Quality. Anyway, the dad is the current Easter Bunny, delivering to all the children in the world, and someday EB will inherit all of this. I was wondering why chicks are always a thing as well during Easter, because apparently I've never really thought about the law before, and it turns out chicks symbolize a new life and come from the eggs. And also Jesus. Hmm. Anyway, chicks are like the elves in this department, with the grumpy second-in-command Carlos clearly being secretly evil. Oh, also there's another chick, Phil, whose entire character trait is constantly dancing to pop culture reference pop music. It's all an excuse to not really put any real effort in. Moving over to the backstory of our human, we come to California. Bit of a trip from Easter Island, but okay. Where, oh my god, the young Fred spots the Easter Bunny. And you know, I don't think I've ever seen a modern Easter Bunny approach before. I mean, he's got his own magical sleigh and an army of rabbits in a compartment, and it's all just very high tech. Did I miss out on all this lore during my childhood? I thought it was just a, a bunny with a basket. This really does feel like a Christmas video if you just imagine the sleigh is red. And then we skip to 20 years later and Fred is in the exact same place, living with his parents. How millennial. And this is actually the plot of his arc. Huh. His family want him to move out and get a job, which, you know, fair, but in this economy, in Hollywood, have you seen the rent? And back to E.B. again, and he's now a drummer. With Phil headbanging along to Good Charlotte, because this is the early 2000s, apparently. The dad disapproves of the noise, saying he should be rehearsing a speech as he's about to be crowned the new Easter Bunny, but E.B. isn't interested. Drumming is his dream. Also, there's this. What about China? What's that? Oh, oh, it's candy, woman! What the fuck? I was... All right, so 
we haven't cracked China yet. Why do I get the feeling this line was extracted from like the Illumination Executive Board? Anyway, EB is told he's gonna be the bunny and he has to get his priorities straight, to which EB decides to run away that night, using this whole based public transport system device thing in the middle of the island. Is this just because they're bunnies? Is it an Easter thing? But they're on an island, like surrounded by water. What is this law? And you'll never guess where EB goes, Hollywood. Meanwhile, Fred storms off from the family until his sister, oh hey, it's her, comes to the rescue with a crazy opportunity of luck. See, she apparently has access to a mansion in Beverly Hills for two weeks, house sitting for her boss, and has given Fred a job interview at a gaming company he loves. What? What a fortunate string of events! Or just terribly contrived writing, but we'll go with it. Think of this as a reboot, right? Also taken from an executive meeting. With Fred sorted for a fortnight, EB's plan in Hollywood is to go to the Playboy Mansion. This is not a joke. It's in this kid's movie. The Playboy Mansion has been home to sexy bunnies from around the world. Why? And after being rejected, we get a sad walking montage with yet another song, Every Rose Has Its Thorn. I've yet to feel a genuine twang of original writing beyond the plot convenience, the unexplained lore, and the adult attempted jokes. That being said, there's something I will give a little credit to this movie for. It's no Guardians of the Galaxy, but some of the lines are pretty witty and gave me a smile. Oh, how could this night get any worse? Oh, I see, car accident. Or maybe it's just Russell Brand's delivery I like sometimes. Either way, sometimes something lands. It's a tad better than meow, anyway. But yes, the two finally meet, and Fred sees that EB's still alive, but doesn't recognize the clothing, I guess. Choosing to help out by dropping a massive stone to take them out of their misery. <laughs> I like that. Anyway, EB starts talking, Fred freaks out, and they both run into the mansion. They chat, it's awkward, you get all this, and EB demands to stay over as a favor and is allowed into the garage. As for EB's family, they haven't responded really yet. The dad isn't really freaked out and only just learns about the whole escape plan, and even still, he's more sad than anything else. As for Carlos, he's incepting the idea of disowning EB and begins hopping too hoping to take the mantle for himself. Also, here's Phil enjoying Burn Baby Burn as he works, because of course he is. He has no other personality. Song relevance be damned. And the dad finally does something by sending out the pink berets. Three emergency ninja bunnies. One with a phone, one with a tranquilizer, and one with an inhaler. One out of three of these traits never comes back. It's the next morning, and Fred checks on EB just in case it was all in his head. Understandable. And EB is gone. So, actually putting his life together, he does as he was told by his sister, and preps properly for his job interview today. Also, he remembers he needs to feed the dogs, which goes, interestingly. Sure, it's a funny scene for the kids, but this is practically all we see of them. They're not really an asset for the movie, just a one-time gag, pretty much. This script is awfully shallow in content. But with that out of the way, now EB's influence has returned, because he's playing the drums upstairs and has made an awful mess too. Bit of a dick move. Why do all these animal characters do this? Anyway, Fred then goes to kick him out, driving a car that are we sure is from 2011? No wonder I thought this film was so much older. EB's afraid of the prospect of rattlesnakes, eagles, and dogs out in the wild and begs not to be left alone. He's special, literally. He poops jelly beans. I'm very lost when it comes to Easter lore, apparently. Regardless, it sparks something in Fred as he realizes the Easter Bunny is real as he always thought as a kid. And so they band together for a car ride. I don't know why this is a running theme in James Marsden's life, but the world works in mysterious ways. Fred goes for his job interview while EB is supposed to chill in the car, only to be hunted by the pink berets. It's another standard sequence, but still doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Like, sure, Fred's bad at the interview anyway, saying he's writing a novel and then just describing Avatar, because that's not a dated reference that no one will remember the details of anymore, but also EB chooses to crash into Fred's conversations and start a distraction so they can run, even though he's already avoided the pink berets by just entering the building. Why not just hide? Also, he abandons that plan later when discovering a blind band in need of a drummer. Yes, that's a real musical prompt for the guy, and of course he inserts himself into that. Which of course is another excuse for the music to replace the hard work of actually telling a story, though at least I guess this time it's somewhat part of the actual 
actual plot. Fred spots EB, freaks out a little bit in front of the boss, and then asks to go to the restroom, and that somehow then next jumps us to him completely losing the job. Even though he was already set up to be hired, he had a role already assigned. Also, the blind boy's band realised that EB was a bunny, but they don't address the elephant in the room that he's a talking bunny! But they give him a pamphlet to audition in front of David Hasselhoff? What is this writing? Also, the Pink Berets, who had no inkling of tailing EB successfully before, now suddenly know exactly what car he's in to take a picture of the license plate. Was there literally like a deleted sequence between these scenes that would have stitched all of this together? Because we made three massive leaps to continue the plot going forwards here. I'm so lost. Well, I'll fill the gap real quick. If you haven't already, you should subscribe. Only you can help balance out our skewed unsub ratio count. And what are we doing for streams today, future me? Because I haven't worked this out yet. What I've got written down is YouTube shorts. You know that rabbit hole where you watch like little short films on YouTube and then it gives you like a million animated things? We're going to react to that on YouTube through Twitch. And then just go from there. Back at Easter Island, the dad only now is mourning the disappearance of his son, and then Carlos appears again with his non-subtle suggestions for those that didn't get it the last time. The scene's basically a repeat with different suggestions. So back to EB and Fred, they're now at a diner where Fred establishes that EB shouldn't talk to humans or else freak them out. To which EB disobeys and addresses the waitress who doesn't freak out. I'm really lost on what's going through the minds of some of these characters. Why is this an okay trait? Did the writers just not want to attempt the conflict here? What, what did they do with Sonic? Oh, they did the whole disguise thing. Kinda. And then, yeah, one freaks out when it's revealed. That at least works a, a little bit. Still, they come to a deal that if Fred helps EB get to the Hoth, then he'll get out of his life. Because Fred hasn't already lost everything else for this selfish bunny. And to add on to it further, when returning to the mansion, Fred's sister is here now. She learns of the job failure and investigates EB's noise upstairs to give us this creepy scene of EB fawning over the sister while pretending to be a teddy bear. This seriously weirds me out, can we not? Nice. Is she seeing anyone? No, she's single and she's looking for a rabbit. Oh, no. Though to keep the plot moving, we now learn as well that Fred has a school play to go to at 7 o'clock tomorrow to support their youngest sister. But first, it's time for the Hoff auditions. It's Hoff knows talent. The genre was trending way more in 2011, okay? EB's nervous, plays the drums, and is loved. Why is Hasselhoff not phased by a talking bunny? My best friend's a talking car. Oh, okay, just a super timely reference to the 1982 Hasselhoff movie Knight Rider. I'm too young for this film. And EB is offered to join the Saturday Night Live show. But also, the Pink Berets are scaling here, so EB's not getting out of Fred's life at all. Nice. And they escape by car instead. Also, remember how the sister said the little sister's play was tomorrow night? Yeah, apparently it was today tonight. Because we're here now, and they're performing the magic of Easter, because of course they are. The little sister, who's established to be good at singing, is terribly off-key as a joke, and EB freaks out thinking the rabbit shadows are the pink berets, leading to this sequence of events. EB starts talking to calm down the crowd, they call it ventriloquism, everyone starts dancing, and this frog is having a wild time. And everyone just gets into it because the writer's left and the show must go on. But hey, I like this bit. You should be nicer to your son. Well, it's just... It's just a thought. It's a good line from the ventriloquist perspective. Anyway, the little sister kicks him afterwards and the dad confronts Fred to say he's disappointed in him. No surprises there. And in this moment now, Fred comes to the realization of where you can imagine his arc was supposed to conclude. He is to be the next Easter Bunny. It took being surrounded by Easter stuff to come to it. So Fred preps to tell EB. Wait, is this where you tell me you want to see other rabbits? Cause I'm open-minded, Fred. What? No. Fred explains that being the bunny must be his destiny. Witnessing him as a kid, meeting EB, it all just makes perfect sense. Well, as much sense as bunnies sharing eggs over chickens. Also, here's another scene with Carlos again, preparing all the chicks for a revolution, while Phil acts as the dopey comic relief, not understanding figures of speech. I swear, the only original parts of this film are the ad-libs the stars sprinkled into the script. With Fred set on his Easter Bunny goal, we're then gifted with more music as he montages through the trials of the bunny. All the while, Carlos is doing the exact same unsuccessfully. This is really, really stupid. Why is Carlos addressing the audience? When are any of these skills applicable? Anyway, Fred gets better at them and the montage ends. And the pink berets now crash into the mansion. 
probably could have done that earlier, considering they were tailing the car, but whatever. They tranquilize the dogs, chase EB, and he sets up a turkey trap. Then hops in a Hasselhoff limousine and drives off to the Saturday show. With more music. How convenient. As for Fred, the pink berets tranquilize him. The dude really gets the short end of the deal with this connection with Eevee, doesn't he? And next thing we know, he's on Easter Island. How did he get here? Through the hole? This makes no sense. Now Fred believes he's here to be inaugurated as Easter Bunny because he's low-key lost the plot, and in actuality, everyone thinks he's killed EB because the turkey trap was wearing one of EB's outfits, looking like a cooking murder. How the Pink Berets also brought the turkey trap with them, as well as a 5 foot 8 human being, is something you really shouldn't think about. And yes, I googled James Marsden's height, don't at me. Carlos then uses the opportunity to trap every bunny into a single room and heads a coup, turning the berets into solid chocolate with some awful CGI, because I guess they ran out of budget all this way in, and the chick sees Mr. Bunny. EB is questioning himself in the mirror, which turns into a flare of originality briefly. Then Russell Brand makes his cameo appearance for those that recognize him and his EB casting, and when asking Hasselhoff what to do, he says to go to Fred instead, kind of taken away from the logic of his character, since surely he's all about putting on a good show for his branding, but okay, sure. Plot needs to work out somehow, doesn't it? Gotta, gotta compliment Hasselhoff as being the good right guy. Are we sure the writers are still here? So Carlos has the Egg of Destiny, which is apparently like the wand that gives the powers of the Easter Bunny to, you know, drive a sled and walk five steps. And Carlos decrees that children don't want candy and chocolate, they want bird seeds, dried crickets and worms. Kind of a last minute switch to make kids recognize that they don't want him as a leader. Also, how did they supply all of this on like the night of Easter, essentially? What was the planning logistics behind all of this? Especially in secret, how do they have these supplies? Whatever, EB now makes his appearance and is shot up by a gummy cannon. The dude doesn't actually help the situation in any capacity. Fred and the dad are to be lowered in some boiling substance, but the ropes they're tied with are made out of black licorice. It'd be nice if they'd somehow established that only Fred could eat it, liking the taste, but no, it's just for now. <sighs> They escape and EB is saw bladed. Except he's not because of the sole reason of he dodged them all. Oh boy. And they cut off his gummy restraints instead. I think the writers literally didn't have a fix for this, so they just gave up. Fred and the dad jump off their trap and that's them done for the film. No, really, this action scene is done for them. It's over to EB now, who's sent to go to Carlos over by the magical sleigh. That egg of destiny, by the way, is showing its powers. Flight, as all bunnies are known to have, as well as deforming the guy to have rabbit traits. And EB would have inherited this himself? Despite already having- alright, let's move on. EB is beezing in a fight for not being strong enough, and as all the chicks prepare to fly off in the sleigh, Phil is set to be the air marshal. Wonder where this is going. Hey, at least it's well established. EB, now next to a random drum lying around, conveniently starts, what do you know, drumming, and it completely distracts Phil's gesturings. For a full minute and a half, we have Phil dancing along to EB music, Carlos being thrust every which way, and eventually crashing onto the ground. And that's literally it. Bit of an abrupt ending, but as we said, the writers left like 20 minutes ago. The rabbits say sorry to each other, the pink berets are forever stuck in solid chocolate and we never see them again, rest in peace to that one with asthma, and Fred O'Hare is crowned as the new co-Easter Bunny with EB, who accepts his role. Though considering this is a job for one day in the year, you'd really think he'd be a whole lot less hesitant. It's practically as lazy a job on work ethic as possible. And off they go, flying through the skies to deliver. They legit never come back to any other story beats. There's a final family dinner the next morning, Fred has a new uniform, the dad shoots him down only to see the slave for himself, and now he's proud of him. Spouting every generic supporting father line possible back to back to back. The formula machine just never stops running. And despite just doing their night's work last night, they randomly fly off again now in the middle of the day. Though hey, Carlos is being punished by pulling the slate too, so there's that. I'll be honest, I was somewhat getting into this movie at first, but that ending just kind of dropped off, didn't it? It is literally like the writers just gave up and left early. The final action sequence is brief with minimal callbacks and one beat for each character it seems. And nothing really wraps together or makes logical sense beyond beelining to the credits. The film is just stuffed with generic, formulaic, robotic writing. 
and sprinkled with humor for the generations. Phil is just one big boomer bait, and for the kids, some stuff gets pretty stupid. That being said, there were some wittier lines that I liked, though I feel like it was just the actors trying to make the best out of the crappy script they were given. Oh, but there is this one thing, the post credit scene. Fred, what did she say? Was that about me? I fought you. The dialogue's a bit naff, but the thought is there. An Illumination executive's wet dream, cracking the Chinese market. But yeah, this film was lazy through and through. But hey, it's cool that like the gaming company hiring Fred was the same one that made the drum games that Eevee likes, I guess. But why are the rabbits British on Easter Island whilst Carlos is Hispanic? Am I reading into this too much? I should stop before I rabbit on any longer. Hope you enjoyed this terribly messy, uh... Christmas movie. Yeah. My name's been Daz. You didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit. Thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video. I associate Christmas with just endless amounts of chocolate. So this counts as a chocolate f as a chocolate film? Well, yes, it does. A Christmas film, right? Yeah, sure. The code name for implying that you've seen the end of the video is chocolate. Chuck in chocolate in a comment. I know you are a real fan. But yeah, sorry for making an Easter film in Christmas. I wanted to do, do, to do Illumination Week, uh, and uh, I, I should have done the Grinch. I, I should have done the Grinch. Why didn't I do the Grinch?